Hi, I'm Greg Corumbas. My guest at this time is Brigitte Gabrielle. She's a terrorism expert and chairman of Act for America, which is the largest grassroots national security organization in the United States. Her most recent book is entitled Rise. Brigitte joins me now to discuss the political debate surrounding the killing of Iranian General Qasem Soleimani and what it says about our larger national security debate. And Brigitte, thanks so much for being with us. Absolutely. Delighted to be back with you. Well, the media and uh, a lot of folks in politics spent a lot of time in recent days arguing that killing Soleimani was a very bad idea because it unified uh, the Iranian people like uh, we've rarely seen. And we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, Defenders of the move to kill Soleimani uh, point to him orchestrating the deaths of hundreds of American troops in Iraq and maiming many more. Uh, You have a personal connection to this as well because you grew up in Lebanon, which devolved from a tourist destination to a focal point of terrorist groups like Hezbollah, which, of course, is bankrolled by Iran. So share with our listeners a little bit about how Iran directly impacted your life. Oh, my goodness. I mean, when you look at the revolution happening in Lebanon right now, the revolution on the streets of Iraq, the demonstrations in Iran, that gives you an idea of how the public in different countries, even certain localities in Syria, are realizing that Iran's tentacles, which extend throughout the whole Middle East as Iran tries to establish hegemony over the Middle East, are basically destroying these countries. My own country of birth, Lebanon, went from being Paris of the Middle East to now being basically a terrorist hub controlled by Hezbollah, which is funded by Iran, and uh, thanks to President Obama shipping billions of dollars to Iran in the middle of the night on pallets, a lot of that money went directly to funding and supporting Hezbollah. So when you look at what's happening in, in Lebanon with the destruction and the corruption at the highest level becoming controlled by a terrorist entity like Hezbollah, when you look at in Syria the corruption and the control of Hezbollah Basically, it was Hezbollah and Shiite members that propped up and continued to prop up uh, uh, Bashar Assad in Syria. When you look at the support and the trouble uh, that the Houthis in Yemen have caused to the Yemeni government, all funded by Iran. And then again, you look at Iraq and the uh, uh, resentment in Iraq on the street against the Iranians. Uh, What most people are not talking about, Greg, is how the people actually attacked the Iranian consulate in Iraq few weeks weeks before they even attacked, uh, Iran attacked the embassy and killed our own soldiers. So Iran wanted to create a distraction. That's why they killed the American contractor, thinking it's going to distract people in Iraq. And as a result, we're seeing now incredible revolutions on the streets of four countries rebelling against Iranian influence. Uh, Brigitte, uh, the critics of this strike say, unlike uh, the killing of al-Baghdadi, this was uh, an official, a very high-ranking official inside the Iranian government. So unless there was a a thorough, specific, credible threat, this never should have been done. Others make the argument that I think you're making here that, uh, no, look at this guy's track record. He just attacked our embassy. He's got a decades-long track record of trying to kill Americans. So uh, so this was already warranted. Uh, Explain where you come down here a little more. Uh, Well, absolutely. Look, Iran is a terrorist regime. Uh, Iran is a terrorist state controlled completely by a dictatorship, by a mollocracy who are oppressing their people, killing their people, massacring their people, and nobody in the world cares. And when their people tried to revolt, uh, uh, you know, nobody paid attention. Obama actually stood with the uh, mollocracy instead of standing with the Iranian revolution when millions took to the streets a few years ago. And so the killing of Soleimani is actually a more prized win for the United States than the killing of um, Imam al-Awlaki or al-Baghdadi or Osama bin Laden combined, because Soleimani has his tentacles and his training, lethal training, on preparing uh, a a lethal army within the Middle East, not only in Iran, Al-Quds force stretched all over into Iraq with uh, uh, the uh, Kata'ib Hezbollah. In Lebanon, Hezbollah in Syria, their militia, in Yemen, the Houthis. And let's not forget Iran's operation also in Argentina, in South America. So the tentacles of Iran spread outside of the Middle East in a major, major way. Look at their operation and their terror network within the United States, even their funding of Hezbollah uh, up 
operation, business operation in America. Um, I mean, they are raising money in America. They are selling cigarettes illegally. They are selling uh, 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 fake products where they duplicate the name brands. When you walk in New York City and you're watching all these persons on the sidewalk where they are selling you, uh, uh, you know, a Dolce and Cabana uh, uh, purses or a- any of that stuff, all the money is going to fund Hezbollah on the fake market, on the black market. That's the tentacles of Iran, and it is all headed there. International operation is headed by Soleimani, and it was the brainchild of Soleimani. Brigitte, let's get back to the media for a moment. Uh, what did you make of uh, their handling of, the, of whether the strike was worthy uh, of being conducted, as well as their uh, focus on the uh, protests in Iran supposedly condemning uh, the death of uh, Soleimani? And now that the protesters are condemning their own government, uh, the coverage is not quite as robust. Uh, no, it is not. And, uh, you know, um, for someone like me who watches Arabic media and understands it in Arabic, you know, I used to be news anchor for World News Tonight and the Middle East for the Arabic language. So I speak the classical Arabic professionally. I mean, that's uh, Arabic is my mother tongue. So for me, I watch Iranian television. I watch Syrian television, Saudi television, Egyptian television in Arabic. In my office, I have them all running while I'm watching American media at the same time. And the difference in coverage, Greg, is shocking. On the Arab street, a lot of the Arab street is celebrating the death of Soleimani. They know that Soleimani was a bad man, not only in Iran, but throughout the Arabic street, even in Egypt, even in Saudi Arabia, even in those types of countries, in Qatar, they understand the danger of Soleimani. In Iran, actually, there are videos of people passing out candy, you know, in in the Middle East, in Arabic culture, when when they're celebrating a good event, a wedding, a birth, uh, an engagement. They pass out candy and bake cakes. After the death of Soleimani, they were baking cakes and passing out candies in the street. That was not covered in American media. When you watch the contrast between American media, you know, to the point of almost, you know, you see the sobbing faces, you know, these sad faces of the part of the anchors at MSNBC and CNN and NBC and, you know, talking about Soleimani like a statement and oh, how sad we killed such a prominent member, yet it's a totally different coverage across the Middle East. Fascinating that the Middle East uh, has that uh, much of a celebratory mood, or at least they're willing to cover the people that that have that mood. What does it tell us about the way that most of the region looks at Iran? Most of the region is threatened by Iran. Remember, uh, the Shiites in in the Middle East are concentrated in Lebanon, uh, and then in Syria, uh, a little bit in Syria, and then in Iraq, and then Iran. The rest of the Middle East is Sunni. So they already see the threat coming from Iran. Remember, Iran was trying to build the bridge, basically a highway uh, for a a weapon to be going from Iran into Iraq, into Syria, and then into Lebanon. And their goal was to attack Israel. And not not only attack Israel, but literally create a balance of power with Russia against America and the Sunni allies like the Egyptians and the Saudis and the Qataris and the people who are working with the United States and even in Israel. Look, the Saudis uh, came to the talks with Israel, allowing the Israelis to use their airspace to get to Iran if they need to take action. The Egyptians allowed the Israelis to use the Suez Canal to allow the Israeli submarines in case they need to get into Iran in case we get into war. So basically, recognizing the danger that Iran poses to, the, to all of the Middle East brought adversaries who were supposedly enemies like Saudi Arabia and Israel to the point where they are now working together uh, in order to stop Iran. The only people who did not understand the threat of Iran was the Obama administration and the leftist media in the United States. Brigitte, uh, we have just a minute or two left in our conversation. And now that we have these protests going against the government, and at least for a while, the Internet was left up so we could actually see and hear some of these protests. uh, What's the best path going forward here? On the one hand, the the president is encouraging them. Uh, On the other hand, you don't want it to seem like there's a ton of encouragement. So they can't argue that this is just a U.S. manufactured protest and the Iranian people aren't really that upset with their government. So um, what comes next? How does this protest turn into something else? 
Well, I think right now the protesters feel empowered and they feel motivated and they feel mobilized and the world is watching. The only difference now is they are dealing, uh, compared to the protests that happened under Obama five, six years ago, is today the Iranian mullocracy is in a much weaker position, especially after the death of Soleimani. Because, look, right now the Iranians understand that their government is so infiltrated on all levels. That's why the guy that they chose to replace Soleimani is over. 60 years old, because they could not trust anybody under 50. They are that much infiltrated. The, the, the Ayatollah is 80 years old. Soleimani's replacement is 60 years old. 70% uh, of the Iranian population is under the age of 30. They are going more secularist. They do not want to have anything to do with the, with the mullahs. And because of the sanctions that President Trump reinstated on Iran, they are feeling the pinch. So right now, you've got members of Hezbollah in Lebanon even feeling the pinch because they are not getting their salaries because Iran is not flushed with money the way they used to be flushed with money. Uh, the Ghani, the new guy who replaced Soleimani, does not have the relationship, does not have the charisma, does not have the wherewithal when it comes to military strategy to really control their operatives across the Middle East. So I, the Ayatollahs are in a very weak position economically. They are in a very weak position when it comes to strategy and direction with their military leadership. And there is only so much they can take. And this is why the Iranians are calling this their moment. This is their moment. If there was ever a chance they will be able to bring down the mullocracy, it is now. And I hope that all the people in the world will stand with them, not just the United States. Uh, and I think the world is realizing that truly America has nothing to do with these demonstrations. These are organic. Uh, uh, this is an organic movement by the people, for the people of Iran, who are finally said, enough is enough. We want equality, we want freedom, we want justice, and we do not want oppression, and we've had it. And so I wish them all, you know, we all wish them all the best. Brigitte, we'll stop there. Thank you very much for your insights, as always. I thank you very much. Always a pleasure being with you. Brigitte Gabrielle, terrorism expert, chairman of Act for America, the largest grassroots national security organization in the country. Her latest book is Rise. I'm Greg Columbus, reporting for Radio America.